I can't control what the media says or does, but all I can control is the things that I do. But um, people just love to try to bring people down this day and age rather than picking people up. They always want to dwell and try to look for negatives. And there's too much jealousy and just, you know, and, and spite against people that are successful rather than sitting there and trying to use that as motivation to better themselves, better their lives and, you know, hopefully get to that position. I've always been the motivated type. I've always wanted to motivate myself. I've never been jealous of anybody or, you know, or wish I had something that someone else had. No, I mean, I've always wanted to, you know, become the best I can by working hard and, and let, you know, other people's success motivate me to get to the level I'm supposed to. And, and now it's just another one of those moments that you can see how people are trying to bring someone down from them being successful and doing something that they haven't done before. I am genuinely excited for this one because Patrick Reed is one of the more mysterious figures in pro golf, I would say. People know some things about him, but certainly not everything. You just wear boots around like town? Oh yeah. So I actually got married in these. Did you? Yep, I got married in these. These are my Laredos. I mean, I have Luke Casey's. I have some of the best boots you can think of, but I always go back to these. Once they break in, there's nothing better. While I'm sure we're not gonna get the entire story, I wanna pick up on some key elements of his life and his career that have gotten to this point, that have made him a Masters champion, a Ryder Cup hero, a beloved and, uh, I guess, controversial figure. Everyone has an opinion on Patrick Reed, right? Love him or hate him. He knows that. How does he feel about it? What made him that way? And I don't know, what's next for him? So we've got a sit down with P. Reed. We're gonna get into a little bit of everything, so. We have Mr. Patrick Reed in the building in a very large room, <laughs> cavernous uh, spot at the Biltmore. Patrick, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. People have a lot of opinions about you. Uh, there's, a, a, I guess, a lot that people think about you. So we're excited to have you here to actually just ask you a few things about your your life and your career one-on-one. -on -one. So right. appreciate yeah. that. Of course. And I guess I kind of want to focus on, on how you got to where you are right now, starting early, because okay. You know, you, you won the Masters. You became one of the best golfers in the world. Where were the first signs of that? Like, when did you first know that you were pretty good? Would have probably been probably like 15-ish, 14, 15, kind of, kind okay. of like right when I was about like in eighth grade, whatever age that would be. Yeah, yeah, 13, 14, um, somewhere in there. Because at that point, it's when I started playing on the high school golf team, started playing the amateur events that were – AJGA events where you're playing against older age groups and um, you know guys that are just about to go to college, so they have quite a bit of years on you. When I was playing, I was playing against older guys, so I wasn't winning as much as when I was really young. Really young, and then when I started winning all those events in the city and the state and thing like things like that in Texas, then I was like, all right. Then we went to national level, and then I started AJGA. It taught me right off the bat that hey. There are other ways to win golf at a golf tournament than just set up and hit it as hard as you want. Because of that, I was able to kind of come out and, you know, just play, you know, sharpen my tools and play my game rather than trying to play others. And my biggest sign of that was right after uh, we went and we won our second national championship at Augusta State. And I was 6-0 in match play for through there. And, you know, that, that final year when we were playing at Oklahoma State, I had to play Peter Uline. Harris English guys are, you know, are really established tour players now. Well, I literally tapped in, we finished, we won, and then we drove to uh, Memphis because I was in the first, my first PGA Tour event ever played. No kidding. Well, I get there and we have a game plan with my caddy I'm using, who was actually my assistant, uh, our assistant head coach at Augusta State at the time. You know, about six holes in, I'm seeing both of them hit iron off of this one tee. 
well, my game plan was to hit three wood or driver. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I need to, you know, they, they've won, so maybe I need to do what they do. And so I completely changed and just kind of tried to do what they were doing and ended up missing the cut. Mm. And the first thing I sat back and looked at and the first thing my coach said and we talked about was, well, why'd you miss a cut? He's like, you're playing some of the best golf that you've had, you know, going up to that point. And well, I was kind of going through my game plan. And he's like, well, did you stick to your game plan? I was like, no, I did this and that. Why? And what we found out is like, hey, just because someone else does it and they have success that way, it doesn't mean that's who you are and how you play. You have to keep your identity when you're out there playing and stick to your guns and stick to your game plan. Because when you stray from your game plan, then that affects you mentally. And, you know, then all of a sudden, even though you don't think it's doing anything, but it's a trickle effect, you start changing things. Then your mind starts going, you start second guessing this, second guessing that. And um, so it's just kind of that's kind of built me to kind of get to where I am now is yeah. by doing it how I do it, stay how I go and just, uh, you know, keep grinding. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't, you really don't strike me as the kind of guy that would look at the way someone else does it and be like, yeah, oh, that's no. the way I should do it. So that must have been sort of a, a temporary blip It was, blip a, one, yeah, it was a one and done thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was the first time that happened, but I mean, those things are things you learn from really quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, rather than sitting there and dwelling on why I missed the cut, and you know, it's like okay, you know, basically just dwelling on missing the cut. It's like okay, so, so why did I? Yeah. You know, I mean, some weeks it's like oh, I hit it poorly, but then other weeks you're like, wait, well, I went at it something differently than I normally am, and it's always about being authentic to who you are. And uh, yeah, you know, let's be honest. These in these days and age, being authentic to who you are can. You know, some people are going to love it and some people aren't. So, I mean, that's just, you know, that's the way it is. But if you're true to who you are and you, your beliefs and how you do everything, then that's where you're going to get the best results and the best best you. Yeah, you, you mentioned earlier that, yeah, being yourself is going to rub some people the wrong way. Seems like you didn't get along with everyone in college <laughs> or maybe they didn't get along with you. Or I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot yeah. in college. Um, I mean, I actually went into... Uh, played a semester at University of Georgia, went in a year early. Yep. Um, and with going in a year early, the team they had was was stacked. Uh, and I've always been the type that I've always just popped in my headphones, go get work and call it a day, even in high school, yeah. that University of Hyatt on LSU campus. I was a leader of the team, obviously, because of the way I played and, and, and my work ethic, but it was always go in, work, get your work done and, you know, go back and, and rest. So everything for me relied on schoolwork and golf. I mean, that's, that was, that's, that was my job in high school. That's your job in college is, you know, I mean, as a golfer, it's like, all right, well, we gotta go, you know, you're there on a scholarship, gotta go prepare, gotta do your thing on the golf course, but at the same time you need to, you know, you need to practice. Yeah. And then you have to go to class and make sure that you do your things in, in, in the classroom. And, um, that first semester, I mean, I qualified for every event, but um, on Saturdays, I wasn't going to the football games, was, wasn't was really hanging out with the team or anything like that. I was always at the golf course when the sun's coming up, was grinding and, you know, would go to class and yeah. kind of, you know, I didn't really know what real team golf was at that point. You know, I always thought of golf as, all right, well, my main goal is to get to the next level. And so that was my focus. and. Uh, I wasn't really enjoying UGA as much as I probably should have. Um, it was one of those that when I was there, every school I've gone to has been kind of a small school. And when I did my official visit to University of Georgia, it was during the summer. So I didn't have all the kids there. Yeah. So I sit there, I see this amazing campus, and, you know, amazing facilities. I'm like, man, this place is going to be amazing. And when I walked in there, my first class is 100 and something kids in it. And you're just a number and you sit there and you're just overwhelmed with how many people are around. I was overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, obviously. Got uh got in trouble with uh got arrested for underage drinking. Uh, it was funny. It was the first time I ever drank, and I got in trouble for it. Was it really? Yeah, yeah, it was. I that one it. I always feel like gets overblown so, in your uh sort of like whatever past because a lot of us that have been to college, it's like, well, there's a fair well, so, amount of underage drinking going on. Well, so but. everything for me was about golf. So even like in high school and stuff, I never went out, never went to any parties yeah. or anything like that. I was always had a strict curfew of being in by nine, 
And at the same time, it was like, all right, you, when I come, you know, when I'm in at nine, because Saturdays and Sundays, I'm grinding full days on the golf course up early and all that. And because I got that work ethic instilled in me and all that, when I was in college, I was, yeah, I've never, never had alcohol before. All of a sudden I'd show up and hey, I obviously did uh, put all, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always prided myself to be either all in or all out. Well, <laughs> I obviously was all in that night. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, and because of that, I mean, I sat down with coach and he knew that, all right, well, I mean, you're not really happy here. We, we, he's like, I can see it and everything. And, you know, more power to coach hack to sit there and not only give me the release, but also help me find a place that, uh, was more to who I was. So he was helpful in so he getting did. you he helped next me. Step. And that's how you know, I ended up finding Augusta state and, and Josh Gregory, who was the coach. Yeah. And, um, yeah, when I went there, I mean, we won back to back national championships and then, the, you know, yeah. And in the very beginning, I mean, I'm still kind of the same way, even even on team events, if someone's not doing their job or, if, you know, I see, you know, they're not, I mean, I'll, I'll let them know. Yeah, I've always been that kind of vocal type of leader where I'm always vocal and be like, hey, guys, you know, you're not doing your job. Let's go. You know, well, when you walk into a team that's always so close knit uh, and you kind of walk in. Probably a better way to go. in than the first thing you say whenever you go out practice facility and tell the guys aren't practicing to jump on and be like hey why aren't you working you got me practicing because i mean was that your vibe at that at yeah that time? that's what happened yeah. right, right in the very beginning and the guy's like whoa who is this guy you know and i mean hey and, and obviously the relationships started rough right there right in the very beginning but then you know got a lot better as it went on because once you know once you start to get to know somebody you're like All right, this is how this person ticks that's how that person ticks and things like that and so i mean um but no i mean it, i had a really good time there at Augusta State. Uh, I felt like we had a great team and a, a coach that knew the players. So it wasn't that everybody would do the same thing. You'd sit there and go, all right, well, how can I get the best out of this guy? How can I get the best out of that guy to, to get the best possible team out there that we can? And you know, I felt like Josh did a really good job on that. And, you know, the players, all of us, we did what we were supposed to. We went out there, we grinded, we did, we, we did our work and uh, were able to win back-to-back -back national championships. I mean, I know you said you would do some things differently, but these these allegations of, of, of cheating and stealing that have kind of followed you from college. I have no idea where that stuff came from. Really? I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, both coaches even, you know, had signed statements saying that, no, he's never stolen or cheated ever. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that stuff is, to me, BS, um, obviously. Um, I mean, I don't know who or I mean, because it's all these unnamed sources. And I mean, no one's actually putting a name to it. And so it's one of those that I don't know why or how something like that would ever come out, especially when it's never came out when I was in college. Like no one has ever come up to me. No one so has it was ever not an issue coach. when you were in no, college. It wasn't no. like a, a thing. No, not at all. I mean, the reason I left UGA is I was unhappy. Yeah. You know, I mean, and to be honest with you, I'm glad I did, because if I didn't, then who knows what those next couple of years would have been like. I mean, when you're unhappy, you don't, I mean, you're kind of unmotivated on a lot of things. So because of that, you know, I went to a place that felt like would, you know, make me happier. And because of that, uh, you know, I worked harder and was, was able to uh, get to the level I really want to be at. And that's out here. When you turned pro was, uh, was there a significant adjustment? Were you able to kind of do your same thing and have your similar approach or was there a, a level of adjustment required yeah, there's a little bit of adjustment of course so when i first came out it was you know obviously course management but for me it was also managing my time and managing my workload tournament weeks because you know I've, I've always grinded i'm known to be a grinder and just you know work non-stop yeah is well, there a risk of overuse and wear and tear well, and not as so much as overuse or wear and tear as much as making sure that you're fresh Thursday through Sunday. Okay. Because my Monday through Wednesday, I'd hit so hard that, you know, yeah. the energy level for recovery, it's hard to recover fast enough and to be ready to, yeah, you'll be good for Thursday, Friday, but you also have to be ready Saturday, Sunday. And so like figuring out that balance of, okay, if I'm playing three or four weeks in a row, what's my workload look like each week? So I'm still fresh to be able for the tournament rounds, but at the same time, feel ready and prepared. Yeah. So it was all about making sure that when I was out there, I was very efficient with my time and very efficient with the things I was doing to get the most out of the 
the hours I'm out there working. So then I can get in, get out, you know, recover and be ready for each and every day. When was the first moment you felt like you were, you were on the map? You were like, not just okay, you're getting starts on tour, but like people know you and you now have a, a certain reputation. Well, Started pretty early because of what I was doing in the Monday fall yeah. fires. You were I mean, Mr. Monday. Was that 2012? Yeah. What was it? that? Was 20? Uh, 2012. Yeah. Yeah. So I did all the Monday qualifiers, and after I got in like three or four in a row, I mean, I'd walk in the locker room. Guys, like, you did it again? Like, yeah. He's like, man, I swear. He's like, you're gonna be out here every event because you can qualify. And um, so with doing that, I mean, I was actually so I was six for eight that year on the Mondays. I mean, it still but is sort of a ridiculous accomplishment. The, that the funny thing really is do. I was six for six. I was hundred percent when I had no practice round. I was 0 for two on the places I had to practice. The practice round. was the problem. <laughs> and so, you know, I ended up not earning enough through those events to get my tour card. So I went through Q school and, um, wait, can you explain that? Like, how is it that you were just going and, just you know basically being the best golfer in the world on monday of the event and then right. it wasn't translating to the same level well, so, of play no, well i feel like it was i mean i was playing well in the events I yeah mean, i played well in a lot of them i mean had a bunch of decent finishes as a guy who had you know first coming out and all that stuff but um just not enough just didn't have enough events that. i mean i started i started chasing the mondays at san antonio because it was close to houston where i was living Oh, I went to Q school, one first stage, one second stage. Um, then I would go to final stage. And my, I mean, my wife's caddying through all of this, but at the time she was my fiance, but um, caddying through all of this. And um, we get there and at final stage, it's six rounds. And I had two holes that just blew me out of it the first two days. And I'm like, you know, we're, we're barely beating anybody. Yeah. And only top 25 get in. And I'm just like, I'm done. I was like, honey, let's go home. I was like, we're about to get married. I was like, let's, let's fly home, save whatever money it is for the hotel rooms of these four days and all that. Yeah. I was like, cause you know, so we could start fresh. She's like, no, nah. she's like, give me one more day. So she actually kept me there basically. Give me one more day. She's like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, fine. She's like, what well, you treat tomorrow like a Monday. I'm like, okay. So I go out and I played well. So I'm shooting four, I think it was four under or five under. And obviously jumped off the leaderboard a little bit. I'm like, all right. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, me sitting there, I'm going, there's, it's a long shot, one to get in. But then at the same time, I'm like, I mean, I'm going to need to shoot like nine or 10 under on one of these days. And then we go the next day and, you know, she goes, all right, well, treat. And she kept me there on another day. She's like, right, treat today like a Monday. All right. We go out there, end up shooting, I think, four or five under again. Because uh, I went, I had two five under rounds and two four under rounds. I think I shot, I shot 18 under the last four rounds. And so, but then after the second round, she's like, all right. She's like, well, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, I was like, okay. And then before we went to bed, well, tomorrow's Monday. Treat tomorrow like a Monday. And I went out and played, you know, played well again. And just got, you know, another four or five under par round, got a little closer. Still, still decent ways off. I'm like, yep. you're gonna have to shoot, you know, you're gonna shoot four or five under again to have a chance. Um, and literally that night, she doesn't say anything to me. I'm like, okay, well, she's not gonna tell me treat, treat it like a Monday. Yeah, yeah. She's done what that. day is it? So I'm sitting yeah. there and all right. So I wake up in the morning when the alarm goes off, she goes, hey, guess what day it is? Like what? She's like, it is actually Monday. Let's go. <laughs> and I went and I ended up just playing solid again and uh, ended up making it on the number and I shot 18 under the last four rounds combined to uh, get, our, get our tour card. What was it like becoming Captain America? That was unbelievable. What was the evolution of that? How did, how did that happen? The fans gave me that. The yeah. fans gave me that nickname, the fans of the media. And um, anytime being able to represent my country means so much to me. You know, my brother-in-law, he's a veteran and you know, I mean, I've always wanted to uh, represent the United States and, you know, carry the flag and you know, be proud of who I am and where I'm from. And when I played my first Ryder Cup, I got my first Ryder Cup and, you know, Captain Watson brought in some uh, wounded warriors to talk to us and, you know, their stories and how much it just meant to represent the United States and be there for the United States meant everything to me. and. They gave us a, um, you know, American flag, a full American flag, every single player. And um, that has 
stayed in my golf bag since the day they gave it. It doesn't matter where I'm playing, no what kidding. I'm playing, what bag I'm using. Yeah. That is the one thing that is in every single golf bag. I do not play around a golf or hit a golf shot without that in my golf bag. It's in my golf bag here at the hotel. It stays with me. And, um, you know, there's just the, there's that pride of representing your country, playing for your country and, uh, you know, going out there and doing anything for the red, white and blue. So that was not a surface level thing. You deeply felt yes, that. Yes, that was that meant that meant a lot to me. Was that the the moment where you felt like the fans were on your side more than they'd ever been up to that point? It was playing for the U.S. Oh, team. Oh, for sure. And... Um, yeah, I mean, you never really you, you always hear the stories of how the fans are at Ryder Cups, and you know until you actually experience it and you're on that team, it's I mean, you can't even put it into words. I mean, they say how amazing it is. It, it's and how pumped and excited they are. It, take that and times it by a thousand. I mean, it is insane how much they get behind you. And, you know, and to be able to represent your country and then on top of it to have the fans behind you, you know, whether you're at home or away is, is unbelievable. And it's almost even more fun when you're away because then, I mean, I, I'm all about proving people wrong because in this day and age, if you look at the media, if you look at social media, if you look at every article that's written, nine times out of 10, everything has a negative twist. Everyone's all about the negative. Well, I mean, our society isn't going to get any, isn't going to go anywhere and it's going to not going to improve if everyone's always so negative. Instead of tearing people down, pick people up. And so I've always been the type of proving everyone wrong. And so with, with playing in those Ryder Cups, and especially, you know, when you go overseas and they're like, oh, well, I mean, they don't ever have success over here, blah, blah, blah. Well, let's go prove them wrong. And so it just kind of gets me going even more. And, and yeah. so for me, it's always, you know, I've always used that as motivation to keep driving myself to, uh, you know, just, you know, be true to who I am and then prove people wrong on, you know, all the naysayers out there. I don't think that you necessarily uh, chose to be some sort of villain, but in these team events, in these uh, Ryder Cup moments, you seemed to play your best golf when people were against you, or even when other, you know, little mini controversies came up. Like at Tory, right. you went out and and there was a you know dispute about the drop you took, and then you I don't know you won by which, five or six. And, yeah, which was let's let's go let's go to Tory. Maybe we go well, one by let's one. Go, here. Let's yeah, go yeah. to Tory first since yeah. that was the first, that, that last we brought up. So Tory was so weird because. It was really wet that day. Well, really that whole week, it was freaking soaking wet. We we're playing lift, clean in place in fairway. Obviously, well, closely mown areas, fairways. Yep. And um, I'm in that bunker on 10, hit, you know, hit it, kind of kind of catch it just barely heavy. And it's almost like, it's weird. I, I still don't understand. I've asked my coach a thousand times. He doesn't understand either. So if you barely catch it heavy out of a fairway bunker, like just just enough sand, the ball go obviously will go up because it's not catching grooves, but it always goes left. It always is like, and I'm like, why is that? Well, why well, doesn't it ever go right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, but I mean, he's like, I don't know. And um, <laughs> we couldn't see the ball bounce, obviously, because I'm also looking over a lip and I'm watching this thing miles in the air and left. And so I asked the guys in my group, hey, did y'all see it? Did y'all see it bounce? They're like, no, we didn't see it bounce. Okay, cool. I walked up. First thing I asked the spotter, because obviously the spotter's standing right there. Did it did it bounce? No, it didn't bounce. Okay. So whether it bounced it or not, it's irrelevant. That it really at the end of the day. But uh so that's the only reason why I was like, all right, well guys, I'm gonna check for an embedded ball. Cause if it didn't bounce, I mean, it's a ninety nine percent chance that it's plugged, especially with how wet it was that week. So all right, he's like, Yeah, of course. So put the T in, pull it out, you know, go through the whole yeah, the whole thing. I mean, all saw it on camera and all that. Mm -hmm. And so get done with the round and there's rules official standing there. He's like, Hey, can I see all y'all? Oh, you three. I like, okay. So I want y'all to watch something. Okay. So he pulls out his phone. He's showing the video. I'm like, we're all watching. We're all kind of like looking back and forth, like mainly looking towards me. I'm looking at them. I was like, all right, so is there an issue? Yeah. Because no, we'll keep watching. Because I mean, at that point I'm getting antsy, obviously, because I've seen half of it and it's kind of going through. I'm like, what's going on here? And he's like, so it finished. He goes, so did y'all see anything wrong? And all of us are just kind of looking like, no. It's like he's like 
correct. He's like, you did everything by the book. And so then finally we're like, so what's the, what's the issue? Well, you're getting hammered by the media. It's like, why? Uh, Cause the ball bounced. I was like, okay. They're like, but you did everything perfectly. It doesn't matter if the ball bounces or not. If the ball's embedded, then, you know, you went through every protocol the exact way you should. Perfect. No issues. Yeah. But it's another one of those things that I felt like it could have been handled a little differently on the tour side at that time to where they had my back a little more rather than just one rules official coming out and saying, hey, oh, yeah, you know, no, he, he did everything correctly. You know, because the media wants to keep me in that villain role. So they're like, all right, well, we're going to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. And so then I sat there and I was like, all right, well, there's one way to shut these people up. Go ahead and win this thing by more than two shots. You go win by five or six, you trounce everybody on Sunday. Yeah. I mean, doesn't matter. <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong. And then yeah. also at the end of the day, if you're not guilty and you feel like you did the right thing, you're going to play better. If you are trying to, you know, finagle your way around something or, you know, you're guilty about something and you don't, you, you know, you did the wrong thing, yet you're still trying to get away with it. Do you really think you're going to play well, especially with golf being 90% mental? No, you're going to play poorly. I think I might crumble in both scenarios, exactly. to be yeah, honest. Well, so, <laughs> well, so, I mean, that was one of the, you know, I'm like, yeah. well, I mean, obviously, you know, and so not doing anything wrong, but that was another one of the scenarios of the media trying to keep me as this, this villain. And do you think you've done anything to really earn that reputation? Like when, you know, the like people talking about, well, well the, the reason why that all came about was because of me basically, you know, being vocal about and, you know, vocal about me feeling like I was one of the best players in the world when I won that WGC. So is that, yeah, is that where you kind of trace it back to? Well, there's 69 guys, 69 of the top, the top 69 guys are in that field. And I had Tiger Woods in the group in front of me on Sunday and I stared him down in red and black and ended up winning the golf tournament against the best players. And I think that was my third golf tournament I won in like six, like in a short period of time. Yeah. And so, yeah, through that period of time, if you were to take all the players, you know, just through that period of time, yeah, I would have been one of the best players in the world. But I mean, world ranking systems over a two year period of time, blah, blah, blah. But, um, so yeah, could I have not been as vote? Could I have not have said that I believe I'm the top, uh, top five player in the world? Yeah. yeah, I probably, you know, vocally probably shouldn't have said something like that. But hey, if you don't believe in yourself, who else is? Every guy out here believes that they can win every week. If you don't believe you can win, there's no point in being here. Every athlete, every competitor is that way, and that was just I felt like the point where they're like, oh, well, we can, yeah, we can make this guy, we can make this guy the villain. And, but where I have an issue with it is when someone does something well or does something, you know, whether it's win a golf tournament or whether they're doing something to help a community or things like that, they quickly go and want to try to bring up old and negative stuff rather than giving props where props are, are due. And that's what's messed up. Yeah. And that's where it's not right. That's where it's, you know, it's mentally abusive and it's not it's not good but um you know during the Ryder cups and things like that i mean when you're captain america and you're in the united states they love you you're not a villain yeah. you're you're the hero but then when you're captain america you go over to europe you expect to be the villain because hey i'm captain america i'm coming to take this away from you yeah and so i enjoy i i love going over there being <laughs> captain america and you know be like all right let's go yeah. You know, let's let's throw down. Let's go. Let's have a match. Let's have some fun. And, you know, and, and the great thing about Ryder Cups and, and that stuff is you get to see not only team play, but you also get to see the passion that the guys have for each for their country. But then you also get to see the camaraderie between the players. And if you go back and you watch a Hazel team match with Rory and I where yes, we're, we're throwing antics back and forth at each other. Right. But then after he made the long putt on eight, and then I topped him with making the putt on eight, and he gave you that I can't hear you, and I gave him the finger wag. Right after, they have the camera still rolling while I'm walking over. We both give each other fist bumps. Yeah. I'm arm wrapped around him. We're walking through the tunnels. And that's the stuff that doesn't get shown as much as I feel like should. When you're out there, you have different types of players. You have guys that were inside, more inside the ropes. You have guys that are going to be happy, smiley, and always engaging with crowd. You have guys that talk to everybody. 
And you're going to have guys like Tiger Woods, like who was always laser focused and couldn't see anyone around, was always like this. Yep. I'm here to do a job, here to win and keep going. Well, I've always kind of been that type that when I'm inside the ropes, I'm head down, let's go. I have a job to do, let's full focus. And so because of that, they use that also as an example, as a way to be like, oh, well, I mean, he doesn't engage, he doesn't do this, doesn't do that, even though they don't really want to get to know me and actually see the charitable work stuff I do, the stuff I do outside the ropes, the stuff I do on, you know, Monday through Wednesday, uh, the stuff I do with all the kids and things, even like right when I get done playing, there's never a camera around there. It's always the cameras are only around when you're inside the ropes. But it's all about, you know, we're, we're there doing our job, which is to play golf. And you have different personalities in a way that they can do it the best way. And, you know, it's just all these things that uh, the media likes to do to try to keep you down rather than pick you up. Is that where the lawsuits come from? Why, like, why, why get into legal action? Someone needs to make them stop. Someone needs to hold them accountable. They hold us accountable for everything. If I say boo, I'd get fined on tour. If I, you know, if... If you take an improper drop, even if you do it correctly, you know, the media can attack them as much as they want. You know, we're held accountable for everything, but the media is not hold, held accountable. They think they can just sit here and, and hide behind the freedom of speech the whole time when, hey, I mean, yeah, sometimes sometimes it's warranted, right? Sometimes it's warranted to someone say something, but at the same time, there's other times it's not. And, you know, there's a line, a fine line there. and. You know, at some point, people need to be held accountable, and uh, you know, hopefully, one of these days they will be. The Masters must have changed your life, but how did you win it? Being was true, being the biggest thing was being being true and sticking to a game plan. Playing with Rory McIlroy, he's won a lot of majors. Yeah. Um, on paper, you know, he's longer than me. I still have the better short game. <laughs> um but but he's he's longer he you know he's he, he was in better form i mean the the list goes on on the way you know when you're in that final group that it'd be very easy to kind of stray from your game plan to either try to say you know keep your lead or see you know, or at the same time you know try to play you know like another major champion but we kept on just preaching the entire week that hey we're just you know we're going to stick to our game plan, take one shot at a time and and just go and focus on each and every shot. And that's it. When I woke up Sunday, I was the calmest I've ever been. I was just like, I woke up. I was just like, all right, they got, I mean, I always get up early, so I had a lot of time to kill. And I just walked yeah. out of the house, like out, you know, out of the bedroom in the house we were staying at in my sweatpants and, you know, t-shirt when just sat on the couch with the kiddos because the kids were there. We we're watching cartoons. And then all of a sudden, you know, Justine's head keeps popping around the corner. Finally, like, yes, hon. She's like, well, how you doing? I'm like, I'm great. She's like, okay. You know, kind of, you know, because she obviously is sitting there going, I mean, he's going to probably be itching at the bit. I mean, it's first, yep. not only first uh, first major in the lead after 54 holes, but first chance to have uh, to win. Yeah. And, yeah, so I got to the golf course, was was so calm because I was still just in that kind of mindset and that process of just we're going to take every step at a time. And whatever's right in front of me, that's what we're going to deal with and just keep going. I got to the golf course. First thing coach says, hey, you ready? It's Groundhog Day. Yeah, let's go. Went through warm-ups, not nervous at all, just feeling feeling completely normal. I'm like, man, this is – I was like, all right. And, of course, in the back of my mind, I'm like, it's not supposed to be this way. Everyone yeah, tells where me is not, it? Everyone says you're not supposed to sleep. I slept great. Everyone mm -hmm. says you're going to be very nervous. I'm not that. I'm like, well, what's the big deal here? Walk onto that first tee because I go to that putting green by the, the right before I tee off. I go to that putting green by one and 10 tee. Hit a couple of putts there. Still feeling completely fine. Walk up on that first tee. And it's like all the oxygen got pulled out. Mm. I'm like, oh, boy. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I look at my caddy. He's, you know, in his white jumpsuit and he's about as white in the face at that point as the eye couldn't tell. I thought he might be all white at that point. <laughs> He's like, do you feel that? I was like, uh-huh. He goes, all right, here's the three wood. Let's just get off the tee box. You just can't go to the right. Just get off the tee box. And let's get to work. All right. So I pulled Drew it left. Yeah, Rory hit it uh, right. Yeah, he right. hit it yeah, yeah. miles right. Yeah. We get off that tee box, and I got through the first hole, made bogey. He made par. But got through the first hole, and then I was just like, all right. And then Kes goes, all right, let's get back to work. He's like, every shot, let's one shot at a time. 
you know, Groundhog Day, let's get back, you know, let's get back at it. All right. And I literally talked him through exactly what I was going to do off that first, uh, off that uh, second tee and got myself right back in that mindset and didn't feel any nerves the rest of the day. Are you at that point aware of, okay, <laughs> you got like the it crowd of golf on your heels. Like, does, does that make it any different that it's Rory, that it's Spieth, that it's Ricky, that it's, that it's these guys that probably roars are going up all around you right now. Um, I obviously I'm always aware of who who's around you at the leaderboard. I've always been a leaderboard. Do you watcher. use that as motivation or anything? No. Um, because I mean, look how deep golf is these days. Yeah. Anyone can go out there and shoot 62 and get back into anything. Yeah. You, know, you just never know. Yeah. And so, the only thing I, I always keep on reminding myself, especially like in that situation, obviously Rory I'm playing next to, so it can't really, you know, but the other guys like Jordan, Ricky, you know, those guys, it's like, all right, well, yeah, they just got shot closer to me or something like that. But it's like, I, what I keep on telling myself is like, yeah, but I still have that hole to play. Yeah, yeah. You got 13, you got yeah, 15. I still have got... that. They just birdied seven. Well, mm. I still have seven to play. Why can't I birdie seven? <laughs> so it you yeah. know golf is so mental that you have to play those kind of games with you mentally rather than worrying about them and worrying about things you can't control i can't control what those guys do yeah. never can and if someone says they can they're, they're lying through their teeth you can't control what other people are doing yeah out there on the golf course you only can control yourself and it, that's where you have to be able to dig down deep and if you see someone making a run and you haven't played those holes yet or anything like that well well, I haven't played those ones yet. I can do that too. I mean, obviously with winning the Masters comes a ton of attention. You get to meet Lil Wayne. Uh, <laughs> and you get to do, like, what was the coolest thing that came from it? Biggest moment I had and the proudest moment I had is I won, made the putt on the 18th, gave my wife a hug, had to do the ceremony, went to press conference, had to do that. Then when I came, they're like, all right, well, we're going to Butler's cabin. You know, we're going to hold you there for a little bit because then all the members are going in and you go into have like a member well, with the dinner with all the members. Yeah. Well, when I went back to Butler's cabin, I knew my wife and I knew I knew Justine was there, but I didn't know that like the kids, my mother-in-law and everyone who was at the house, they didn't they weren't there on Sunday. So I'm like, all right, well, I mean, when I'm done with all this, that's when I'll see them. Well, when I got there and I go to open the door, Windsor Wells, my daughter, was the first one there at the door. And she goes, Daddy, you did it. I love you. And gave me a hug. And that was that was the moment. I mean, I, could, I mean, it doesn't matter what it was. I yeah, mean, yeah. To hear that from your child is is unbelievable. It's going to be tough to top. And I mean, just just to have that moment with her where, you know, she obviously knows how important that golf tournament is. But for her to, to say that she's proud of you and that she loves you is just something that you're just like, I mean, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I just forgot, I melted. How is your life different on live than it was on the PGA Tour? Uh, we have more, uh, well, feel like we have a little bit more control of of us and things that we can do and can't do. And, um, you know, because of the financial uh, component on gains that we've, you know, acquired through live and the lesser schedule allows us to do more with that. Yeah, you know, allows us to give back. It allows us to, you know, do more things with charities and more things with foundations and, and you know, grow ourselves outside of just being Patrick Reed, the golfer, or, you know, Phil Mickelson, the golfer, or DJ, the golfer, you know, allows us to do better things that make an impact. Uh, on the PGA Tour, obviously has a great, you know, I mean, you know, you obviously have a great foundation and, and vehicle there but the problem is you had to play so many events that you never had time to actually make an impact because let's be honest just walking up and writing a check and giving it to a charity yes you're helping the charity there but you're really not making a real impact the real impact is when you give them time not only are you helping them financially but you're giving them time you're actually making a difference you're doing these things that actually help and actually you know and show that you actually really care. And, you know, so for me, I mean, it, you know, with being a part of live, it allows me to be able to give more of my time and, and focus on more things outside of golf to actually make a difference that 
hopefully, uh, you know, I can make enough difference and can get more people involved that way where there actually is change. What's left for your golf career? What, what's on your bucket list? What do you need to accomplish before? Well, you know? I need to win a live event. I mean, I'm shocked <laughs> I haven't done that yet. That's been driving me nuts. I mean, I've been yeah. out here for now a year and a half and haven't won one yet. So that's one. But the um, biggest thing is, I mean, I'd love to be able, I mean, I'd love this merge, the merger or whatever. I mean, whatever this whole thing is. You can use any of your word you okay, want. Yeah. Whatever it is, it, it needs to be resolved. It needs to be back where we all can come together, play together. And, you know, where I mean, because I'd love to go back and continue playing on the European tour and having a chance to, um, you know, help grow the game around the world again. What would you like people to know about you that, that you that you don't feel like has come across? I'm completely opposite of what all y'all say I am in the media. <laughs> yeah. In, in what I, way? What are some like what are some tangible? I mean, uh, tangible things. I mean, I yeah. love to have a great time. Um, I love to joke around and you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to spend a lot of time with my family and also give back to my communities and try to, every place I go, try to leave it better, whether it's to give time or help or talk to talk to, talk to people that just need to hear a voice and all the uh, foundation and, and fundraising work I do. And, you know, that, um, you know, I'm just out here grinding and they obviously see me at, at work, which is full grind and trying to provide the best I can for my family, but also, you know, to, you know, I'm trying to be the best dad and, and mentor I can be while I'm out here. Patrick, thanks for letting us in a little bit. Really thanks, appreciate bro. it. Yeah, appreciate it.